Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much for your attention. I'm John Donvan. I'm the host and moderator of the Intelligence Squared Debate Series. I'm delighted to have uh, uh, our debate sold out tonight and to have the upstairs packed as well uh, on a topic um, that is uh, as, uh, as lofty as this one uh, and as important. I want to chat with, uh, particularly with people who are new to our debate series, to talk a little bit about how they unfold and in particular about um, your function as members of the audience, which is actually critical to how the debate works uh, in a couple of ways. Most importantly, um, you actually function as the judges of this debate. We ask you to choose the winner. And the way that we have you do that is we ask you to vote uh, your view on the motion twice, once before you've heard the arguments and then after you've heard the arguments. And we declare victory uh, as uh, going to the team whose numbers have moved the most between the first and the so second vote in percentage point terms. So it's the difference between the two votes that uh, determines victory. Um, and the way we have you vote is at your seat, there's a keypad um, attached to the seat. And when the time comes to register both of those votes, I'll just ask you to go to that keypad and to take a look at the motion. And if you agree with the motion, decline us, be damned, bet on America, you'd push number one. If you disagree, if you don't think you should bet on America these days, you would push number two. And if you're undecided, which is a perfectly reasonable position to start in, you would push number three. You can ignore the other keys, they are not live. And if you feel that you've pushed the button by mistake, a button by mistake, just correct yourself, the system will lock in your last vote. And once again, I want to emphasize you vote twice before the arguments begin and then right after the arguments end and uh, victory goes to the team whose numbers have moved the most in percentage point terms. The second way in which uh, you're critical as participants in the debate is in the middle of the debate, I come to the audience for questions. And um, uh, the goal of this, of this exercise is really for these debaters to try to persuade you on this exact motion language. This is different perhaps from other programs that you've been to. This is not a panel discussion. This is really uh, an effort in intelligent persuasion. And they are trying to persuade you to vote specifically on this motion. Therefore, I try to direct my questions to them and I want to ask you to try to do the same. Therefore, the questions need to keep them on this motion. Uh, there are a lot of things that could come into debate, uh, into this conversation extraneously, but I want to say now that if a question, uh, if in my judgment will be repetitive in the short time we have, I will pass on it. If it's a little bit off point, though interesting, off point to help you vote at the end of the debate, I'll again respectfully pass. So I want to ask you to try to keep in mind a question that will get these people to debate further on the topic that's literally in front of them. Also, I want to ask you please not to debate with the debaters. Um, really, really ask them a question. Take about, I'll give you about 30 seconds to get a question out and phrased. I'm okay if you take one of your sentences of, I'll, I'll give you three, th you have three clauses to get your question out. The first, if the first one's the statement of a premise, fine. But after that, I really want you to get to the question. And as I like to say, You'll know it's a question if a question mark lives naturally at the end of whatever you say. So go for that. The third thing is um, we uh, are live streaming this event and we ultimately turn it into a podcast and to a radio show. The podcast can be downloaded on uh, the iTunes store, the Google Play store, and the radio show is distributed across the nation on NPR stations. Because of that, I will have to do little bits of, of formulative phrasing. I will, for example, tell you again and again that my name is John Donvan. It's not because I forget. It's because we come back from breaks in the radio program. And also because of those breaks in the radio program, every now and then, I will ask you to um, spontaneously applaud. And, <laughs> and, if you, and, and, and I hope the thing that fires that spontaneous reaction is if I raise my hand like that, that sort of means, can we have a round of applause, please? So you can just keep an eye on that. I think it'll be fairly obvious. So let's get started. The way that we uh, always begin these debates is that we bring to the stage the gentleman who brought Intelligence Squared US to this stage, and in fact, to the US. And he always comes out ahead of time to share with us a little insight on why it is we're doing this topic and why it is we're doing it now, and a little bit of a look ahead as to, as to where these arguments go and why they're relevant. So please, let's welcome now to the stage the chairman of Intelligence Squared US, Mr. Bob Rosenkrantz. <laughs> John. Hi, Hi, John. So, Bob, this, this one, decline us be damned, bet on America. 
what, how did we get to this one? Well, for one thing, it's a very special occasion because I don't know if you said this in your warm up, but this is our 100th debate. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I did not say that because I wanted you to get that line and that applause. <laughs> that is very kind. That all worked out. <laughs> Good. So, uh, but why, why this topic, Bet on America? Well, it seemed to us really appropriate for our hundredth because so many of the debates that we've done over the, the past six years have been on topics that really are central to whether America is a power in decline or a power uh, in, in the ascendancy. So we, we've debated topics like higher education. We've debated topics like uh, inner city schools and the role of teachers unions. We've debated topics on the economy, on, on income inequality, for example, on foreign policy, on America's proper role in the world, whether it should be the world's policeman or whether it should uh, clip its global wings to pick the titles of two debates. Uh, we've talked about health care, which is certainly one of the largest uh, public policy challenges that the country faces, uh, income inequality, and so forth. So, so many of the basic ingredients of whether America is coping well or poorly with the challenges of the 21st century are uh, debates that we've held in the past that have been very exciting, that have engaged a very broad audience. And it seemed like for the 100th, it might be really nice to have something that's, that's so broad that it can encompass a lot of those themes and a lot of those ideas. So this is the meta debate, in a sense. Uh, in a sense, it is. And we're really proud to be doing it. And something that we, we've done intentionally in a debate about betting on America is we've made sure that at least half of our panel is not American. Uh, well, well that's, that's part of the view of uh, bringing different points of view to the stage. Well, let's welcome our debaters to the stage and thank Bob Rosenkrantz for all of this. Thank you, John. So um, as I said, we are um, we're going to be broadcasting ultimately as a we're live streaming now, but we will be broadcasting ultimately as a podcast and a radio show. And for that reason, unless you're actually live tweeting, which we're delighted to have you do, uh, our hashtag will come up on the screen in just a second for tonight's debate, as well as our handle, which is at IQ2US. Um, we'd ask that you. Uh, shut down your phone so that it's not your phone that an NPR listener hears ringing in Idaho several weeks from now. <laughs> and I just heard my own phone go off in my pocket, so that's what reminded me. Uh, so I appreciate that. And again, just to launch the whole thing, I'd like to invite one more round of applause to Bob Rosencrantz, and we'll get started. <laughs> Hello, I'm John Donvan. Welcome to Intelligence Squared US. As a city upon a hill, a scriptural metaphor that was beloved by both John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan to describe this project called America. But at various times, and this is one of them, we have heard, heard it said that the city upon a hill is actually going downhill. And in a time when the middle class is shrinking and when events overseas are not going to, according to American wishes and plans, that question comes up again. And that question is, has America peaked? Are we on the downhill path? Or is that all just a lot of chicken little stuff? Well, that sounds like the makings of a debate. So let's have it. Yes or no to this statement. Declinists be damned, bet on America. A debate from Intelligence Squared US, and this is our 100th debate. We're at the Kaufman Music Center in New York City. We have four superbly qualified debaters. Two of them are Americans, and two of them are honored, honored guests from other lands to argue for and against this motion, decline us be damned, bet on America. As always, our debate goes in three rounds, and then our live audience here in New York votes to choose the winner, and only one side wins. Again, our motion is, decline us be damned, bet on America. Let's meet the team arguing for the motion, arguing to bet on America. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Joseph Jaffe.
Joseph Jaffe, you are the publisher and editor of the German uh, weekly uh, Die Zeit, and you are a senior fellow at Stanford's, uh, uh, Stanford. You grew up in, the, in Cold War West Berlin, but in 1961, you ended up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and you went to high school there. And uh, we want to know, does that have something to do with your quite favorable view of the United States? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, because it was a hot shower every day, which I wasn't used to in Berlin. Uh, second, uh, root beer floats, <laughs> 15 cent hamburgers, and 28 flavors at Baskin Robbins. Oh, what more could you want? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome the pro-American Joseph Jaffe. And Joseph, who is your debating partner tonight? It's Peter, that's easy. Peter is Zion, ladies Zion and gentlemen. Or Zion? Peter Zion. Zion, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our stage. <laughs> Peter, you're also arguing for the motion, decline us, be damned, bet on America. You're a geopolitical strategist. Um, you helped launch the global intelligence uh, company Stratfor. Stratfor. Um, and then you started your own firm. It's called, uh, uh, actually, I don't have the name right here. What is the name of it? Zion on Geopolitics. Zion on Geopolitics. And you also wrote the book that I do have, The Accidental Superpower, that superpower being this one, the United States. And in your introduction, um, you clarified that this book is not about what should happen, but what will happen. And does that mean you're really saying that maybe the US does not deserve its place at the top? Better lucky than good. <laughs> okay, that's the team arguing for the motion, bet on America. And the motion has opponents as well, arguing not to bet on America, decline us, be damned, bet on America. They're taking the opposite position. Two, two debaters. First, let's please welcome Krista Freeland. Krista, interesting career and recent career move. You're a journalist. Uh, you have worked as U.S. managing editor of the Financial Times, uh, managing editor, director and editor of Consumer News at Reuters. Uh, but in 2013, you left journalism to become a member of Parliament in Canada. Um, you are on the side against this motion, Ben on America. I thought Canadians were supposed to be our friends. We are your friends. We love America. Ah. And it's the job of a best friend to say, you know what? You need to raise your game a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, Krista Freeland. And, uh, <laughs> and do you know your partner's name? I do know my partner's name. I love my partner and his work, and he is the brilliant Jim Rickards. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Rickards. Thank you. Jim, you're also arguing against the motion, decline us be damned, bet on America. Um, you're a portfolio manager, you're a lawyer, you're an economist, you've written some bestsellers, including The Death of Money. This is interesting. You have also advised the US intelligence community and the Department of Defense on capital markets and strategy and defense of those. Are they as worried as you are about our financial future? Uh, they are worried about it, but unfortunately, they have very little to say about it. That's left to the Treasury and the Fed. So the people who are most concerned are at least involved. Oh, well, that doesn't work out very well. But <laughs> I guess we'll hear more about that as the debate continues. Ladies and gentlemen, these are our debaters. Now, this is a debate. One team will win and one team will lose, and that will be decided by you, our live audience in New York. By the time the debate has ended, you will have been asked to vote twice, once before the debate and once again after the debate. And the teams whose numbers have changed the most in percentage point terms between the two votes will be declared our winner. Our motion is declinists be damned, bet on America. Let's register your first vote on this. If you go to the keypads at your seat, see a bunch of numbers, only pay attention to one, two, and three. If you Agree with this motion at this point, bet on America, push number one. And if you disagree, push number two. And if you're undecided, push number three. You can ignore the other keys. Um, they're not live. And you can correct an incorrect vote just by pushing the right button and it'll lock in your last vote. We'll lock that out in just a minute. Let's move on to round one. Round one, opening statements by each debater in turn. They are uninterrupted. They will be seven minutes each. Our motion is, declinists be damned, bet on America, and here to speak in support of this motion, 
Joe Jaffe. He is publisher and editor of Die Zeit and author of The Myth of America's Decline, Politics, Economics, and Half a Century of False Prophecies. Ladies and gentlemen, Joseph Jaffe. America as a has-been is the oldest story in the book. Even right after the revolution, the famous America, uh, French statesman Talleyrand dumped on the United States by saying it's a country with 30 religions and just one dish to eat. <laughs> Little did he know that a bit later, like today, uh, that one dish would blanket the world with 35,000 McDonald's. <laughs> Decline <clears throat> um, is not a real serious diagnosis. It's repertoire theater. Today we are in decline 5.0, we've had four before, and various candidates, Russia, Europe, Japan, uh, were about to overtake the United States, leave the United States in the dust, and now it is, the Soviet, uh, it is China. These prophecies did not pan out because they confused the headlines with the long-term trend. Exhibit A for every declinist is the economy. Uh, where others are always said to be growing faster. But here's the surprise. For the last 50 years, the US share of the global uh, GDP has held steady around 25, 26%. In the same period, the EU lost 11 points, Japan more than two, and Russia has cut its share in half. So who's declining, if I may ask? Let's put it this way, if Rome, starting, say, 2,000 years ago, had been declining at America's rate, we would be debating in Latin today. <laughs> now, a second measure of power is military spending. U.S. is in a league of its own. It spends almost four times more than China, seven times more than Russia, 12 times more than Japan. It spends as much as the next nine countries, together five of whom, by the way, are allies. What does all this cash buy? The short answer is that the US Navy is as large as the next 12 navies together, and its heyday, Britain, only wanted to be twice as strong as the next one. So only the United States can intervene anywhere in the world, nobody else can. Like those um, B-2 stealth bombers that took off in Missouri, dropped their load on Libya, and returned home in one trip. Now, that's a snapshot our opponents will, take, will say. Uh, the others will ev inevitably overtake the United States because they're growing, they're rising. You mean Russia with an economy that one-tenth the size of America, or China, which has a per capita one-eighth of America? China, China, you will say, look, they came from nowhere, they're now number two, but the days of China's spectacular growth are over. It's one, one half of what it once was. And this is no accident. The Chinese growth model is like Japan's and Taiwan's and South Korea. All of them have come down. Uh, the Ch Ch and so there is something inherently wrong with this model. We'll talk about it later. Um, so the, the, they say, well, what about the Chinese Labor force, well, the Chinese advantage is gone too. Productivity has not kept up with the explosion of wages. In manufacturing, the wage gap with the US has almost disappeared. And worse, this year the Chinese labor supply will begin to shrink due to rapid aging. The US, on the other hand, will be the youngest nation in the industrialized wor wor world. But let's think about future. What drives growth in the future? Well, factor number one is higher education. Did you know that of the top 20 universities, 17 are American? The first Chinese university shows up in the 100 to 150 bracket. Um, you, look at, you look at citations in, 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 in scientific journals, you look at patents. The gap between the, the US and China is just as wide as the Pacific. Um, so, and, but the greatest, the greatest American advantage is the power of immigration. China and Russia, closed societies, don't even think about immigration. But here, as you know from the very beginning, the tide continues to flow in. Why do I harp on immigration? 
because it keeps the country not only young, but also from freezing up. Immigration breaks privilege and fuels competition. There's always another group that pushes in, works harder, and rises to the top. The newcomers keep bringing ambition and skill, as they have done for, the 300, for 300 years. Try to become a Chinese. How do you become a Chinese? It's easy to become an American. Here, I'll tell you how to do it. I celebrate 4th of July and Thanksgiving. I joined the PTA and coach Little League. I stop smoking. I buy an SUV and shop till I drop. <laughs> the serious point is anybody can sign up to the American creed. Um, and where did you go to school beats where do you come from any time. As a Chechenian, you'll never become a real Russian. But Sergey Brin can come here from Russia and start Google. Did you know that one half of Silicon Valley's engineers were born abroad? Two fifths of all startups in the Valley two years ago were founded by immigrants? Try that in Vladivostok or Kyoto, or even Madrid. Immigration is the inexhaustible source of rejuvenation, bringing in the world's best and brightest. That's the moral of this tale. Let me ask, end with a surprise confession. I actually like this American obsession with decline. It is part of the country's religion of self-improvement, an offshoot of the prophetic tradition. The Isaiah, beware of sloth, pride, look at your own flaws and keep on hustling. Declinism is the best antidote to decline. But Declanism is repertoire theater, like a good scare, like another sequel to Nightmare on Elm Street. Where are Soviet Russia, Europe, Japan today? Where is 15% growth of China? Um, the truth is only one nation can do in America, and that is America itself. And that's why I like this Declanist agitation. It will make sure it won't happen. So, to repeat, if Rome, have been going downhill at the American rate, we would be debating in Latin today, like gratias vobis et salve, which means thank you and see you in the next round. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Joe Jaffe. And that's our motion, decline us be damned, bet on America. And here to argue against the motion, Krista Freeland. She is a member of the Canadian Parliament and author of the book, Plutocrats, The Rise of the New Global Super Rich and the Fall of Everyone Else. Ladies and gentlemen, Krista Freeland. Thank you very much, John. It's great to be here tonight. As John said, I'm an MP. I debate in a Westminster-style parliament. So I am used to all sorts of rhetorical dirty tricks from the honorable members, the opposite side of the aisle. And I wanted to start by warning you about what I thought were going to be the fiendish rhetorical moves tried out by the other guys. So here are the three things I want you to be aware of and not to be misled by. The first one is, and it's the tough thing about debating our side of this question, that in voting for our side, which is the correct one, um, you are going to be accused of being insufficiently patriotic and efforts are going to be made to impugn your love of the United States. Don't fall for that one. The highest form of patriotism is to see clearly what's happening in your country. The second one, which I'm sad to say we've already heard a lot from in Joe's beautiful, eloquent presentation, is what I call the cleanest dirty shirt argument. And this is the defense of the United States, which basically says, OK, we may have our problems, but everybody else is worse. Look at those Europeans, look at those Japanese, look at those Russians, look at those Chinese. We're not debating here, is the US in less trouble than the world's other countries? We're debating, is the US in decline relative to where it has been? And you know what? You guys have a responsibility to be super good. You are the last remaining superpower. We need you to be morally, intellectually, and in terms of world authority, better than everybody else. So just to be a little bit less bad, that's not good enough. So why do we believe, and, and we say this with real sadness, um, why do we fear that America is in decline? 
The first evidence is what's happening internationally. In the Cold War era, and then following the collapse of the Soviet Union, we lived in a time of what you might call the Pax Americana. And as a Canadian, it was a great time. It wasn't just a great time for America, it was a great time for the world. Unfortunately, we're seeing America pulling back. We're seeing that on big issues like climate change. A huge, there's lots of kids here. We need to be fixing this for you guys. Where is American global leadership on this issue? We're seeing it in a place like Syria. There was a red line. The red line was crossed. What happened? And we're seeing it most acutely, and this is something I'm just so terrified about, in Russia and Ukraine. Joe pointed out, and he is quite right, the Russian economy is one-tenth the size of the US economy. So how come Putin is getting away with redrawing the borders of Europe? And no one, least of all the United States, the US isn't even at the Minsk peace talks right now. Is that not a superpower in decline? And this is bad news for the whole world, because superpowers, as Bob Kagan wrote very brilliantly, are not allowed to retire. Second argument is your political gridlock. And here, um, I think we would all agree that the genius of America is the ingenuity of the American people. It's what each individual person does, and that is fantastic. But I think we would all also agree there's a role from time to time for government to do a few things. Joe talked movingly, and I totally agree with him about immigration being such a strength of America. You guys have a few problems to sort out with that, and you're gonna need government to act, and I don't see government acting. Now, you may say it was ever thus. Washington has always been a mess. I'm a politician, I know what people say about politicians. But Sarah Binder of Brookings did a study last year, and she found that the likelihood of congressional gridlock on a given issue has doubled over the past 65 years. Your government is ineffective at a time when you need effective government for yourselves and for the world. Finally, and this to me is the biggest problem, this is the thing that really keeps me up at night. Democratic capitalism, that great US model, isn't working the way it used to and the way it is supposed to. For the past 30 years, the US middle class has been hammered. Wages have stagnated and wealth has stagnated or declined while the people at the very top have seen their incomes and wealth skyrocket. That is a huge problem for the United States because the US promise, as Joe so eloquently said, is if you work hard and play by the rules, you can succeed. But that is not what the US economy today is delivering. And that's why gridlock is such a problem, because it is going to take a massive, united social effort and really inspired, brilliant leadership to resolve this economic conundrum, which I believe is a challenge comparable to the challenge presented by the Industrial Revolution. Now, you may say to me, well, but isn't this a problem that all the Western industrialized economies face to some degree or another? And I would agree with you. It's a thing we're worried about in Canada too. But this income inequality is worse in the US than in any other Western industrialized country. Your elites are doing better and your middle class is more hammered. Do you know that working men, so men between 20 and 50, the employment rate of men in that group in the US is lower than in France, that's a problem. I want to conclude with a quote. This is from Thomas Jefferson. He wrote, we have no paupers. The great mass of our population is of laborers. Our rich who can live without labor, either manual or professional, being few, and of moderate wealth. Most of the laboring classes possess property, cultivate their own lands, have families, and from the demand for their labor are entitled to exact from the rich and the competent such prices as enable them to be fed abundantly, clothed, and to raise their families. Christopher Freeland, I'm sorry your time is up, but thank you very much. I'll finish it next time.
And a reminder of what's going on, we are halfway through the opening round of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan. We have four debaters, two teams of two, arguing it out over this motion, Declinists be damned, bet on America. You have heard from the first two debaters and now on to the third. Here to argue in support of the motion, Declinists be damned, bet on America, Peter Zion. He's a geopolitical strategist and he is author of the book, the Accidental Superpower, The Next Generation of American Preeminence, and The Coming Global Disorder. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Zion. I considered declining this invitation when it was made. Uh, NPR intellectual is not really my crowd. I live in Texas. But then I realized that the word damn was in the proposition, so I'd be allowed to swear on NPR a lot. So here I am. But enough about my hopes and dreams. Let's talk about you. Where are my boomers? People born 1946 to 1964. Come on, hands up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You guys are freaking army. You're the largest generation you, we you, have ever you need, had. You need to tell the radio audience how many people put hands up. Oh, it's like a third of the total. Okay. And we got a lot of youngsters up top. So, you know, it's, it's a swarm. Most of your consumption, however, is behind you. Your kids have left home, the house is paid for. You're at the height of your tax paying experience, which means that the government's like, I'll take some of that, and then I'll take some more. Today's budget battles, that's the start of our debate about figuring out not how to pay things with your money, but about how to pay your retirement without your money. Something to look forward to which sucks for this next group. Where am I, Gen Y? Or excuse me, Gen X, Gen X. Oh, we're all here. Yeah, we're the smallest generation as a percentage of the population. So very soon it will be up to us, all 11 of us, <laughs> to pay for 75 million retiring boomers. Taxes are gonna be awful, but it's not quite as bad as it seems. Because while the boomers are so convinced that they're so special, there's actually a boomer class globally that relative to the population is about 20% larger than it is here. So yes, we do have a boomer donkulous tax bill just around the corner, but it's actually considerably less than what everyone else is going to have to pay. So, you know, not exactly hope, but you know, shocked and Freud. And, and then there's Gen Y. Gen Y folks, you know, the millennials. Uh, a few of you showed up tonight, that's great. Your age group does the consuming. Kids, houses, cars, pot. It's spend, spend, spend. Your purchases, especially the pot, by the way, are why the economy is doing so well right now. Because of you, because of your bulk, the United States is going to be the youngest developing, or excuse me, developed country in the world in just four years, younger than China. And in 15 years when you have matured, and I use that term in the loosest possible way, you will swarm into the tax paying class with a fervor that Gen X just could have never matched. And Gen X will be settling, settling into the TARDIS-like space that the boomers will be vacating. And America's 20 year effort to digest the boomer demography will finally be over. Now, as an Xer, it really pains me to say this, but you Gen Yers are special because there are no German wise, or Japanese wise, or Italian or Canadian wise. It's as if the entire developed world forgot how to have kids around 1975. And I think we've all traveled enough to know they got the basics down. <laughs> this combination, a bigger global boomer cadre, but no global Y cadre, spells disaster. Consumer activity and tax income will shrink every single year. Retiree costs will increase every single year. It's a deflationary spiral with no escape, and it will happen everywhere but the United States. And that's the good news. Let's talk about the bad news. Let's talk about trade. The idea that you can trade with a country a quarter or a third halfway around the world, that's a very strange idea. Until recently, major countries used their navies to protect trade between their colonies and their mainland. You didn't trade with your neighbor if you could avoid it because you never knew when someone might throw a war and you lose access to everything. These separate imperial systems clashed and those clashes culminated in World War II. Now at the end of that war, the United States forced its, all its allies to sit down and we imposed a new economic system upon the world. We call it free trade. 
We told them they didn't need navies. We would patrol the global oceans and allow them to send whatever they wanted anywhere to anyone at any time. In addition, we would open our market, the only consumer market to survive the war, so they could export their ways back to affluence. In exchange, there was one demand. This alliance would fight the Cold War our way. You heard that right. We bribed up an alliance to take on the Soviets. And it worked. Free trade created the free world. Europe united, Japan rebuilt, China modernized. The global population tripled. Global GDP increased by a factor of 10. One third of the Chinese and Italian GDP export driven. The EU, ASEAN, the Chinese Communist Party, all of that would have been impossible without the safe and reliable access to the global oceans and the US market. Which leads us to the world's most inconvenient truth. The United States didn't create free trade as an economic plan, but as a strategic gambit. We don't use free trade's economic features. Our exports, 9% of GDP, the lowest in the world by a significant margin. We are the least integrated country out there. America's economy and future are not dependent upon the global system. It's the global system that is predicated upon America's willingness to sublimate its market and its military in order to fight a war that ended a generation ago. That is not a safe bet. I mean, really, have you met Americans? We kind of shoot from the hip. The world is now dependent upon our mood. And even should we stick to our Prozac regimen, the majority of the world's boomers will still retire around 2020, which just as surely will trigger a Great Depression if we're lucky. There are many other reasons similarly inevitable why the US will remain the global superpower well beyond our lifetimes. The shale revolution has pushed, pushed North America within two million barrels per day of outright oil independence, and we now have the lowest electricity prices non-subsidized in the world. The US is home to nearly half of global consumer spending, double that of the combined BRICS. The Navy has a 10 to 1 ratio conservatively in terms of global firepower, and the commitment of that imbalance to the global commons is why trade works. And the dollar is the sole denomination for every commodity in every country, especially for those export-driven rivals who are utterly dependent upon free seas and open markets. So when you think of the US, it doesn't matter if you feel a swelling pride, a loathing, or a resigned sigh. Your conclusion is as singular as it is clear. Bet on America. Declinus be damned. Th thank you, Peter Zahn. And that is our motion, Declinus be damned, bet on America. And here to argue against that motion, Jim Rickards, he is chief global strategist at the West Shore Funds and author of The Death of Money, The Coming Collapse of the International Monetary System. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Rickards. Thank you, John. I want to begin with a simple declarative statement, which is uh, I love America, I pray for her, and I wish her well. And it's precisely for that reason that I'm here arguing this, uh, this side, because when you love your country and you see it in decline, when you see a disaster coming, it's your duty really to stand up and say that. And that's, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about that tonight. The second thing I want to say is that almost everything, uh, practically everything our opponents said is correct, uh, but I would suggest irrelevant. Joe is exactly right. No one knows more about the uh, diplomatic history of the last 50 years. Uh, but if you had been uh, an observer at the Battle of Hastings uh, in the morning, you would have uh, said the English had the advantage. They had more troops and higher ground. If you looked at the battlefield at noon, uh, the English were still winning because they withstood a barrage of arrows from uh, William the Conqueror. If you looked at the battlefield at 3 o'clock, the English were still winning because their lines had held. They only had to wait until sundown. It wasn't until shortly before sundown, at the end of the day, in a desperate move, that William the Conqueror uh, pulled out some new tactics, the English lines broke, and the, and the course of history was changed forever. My point is, take no comfort from the fact that prior prognostications have not played out, because I think I'll explain um, in a minute why uh, we're in a much more dangerous zone. Joe talked about, uh, described Aquinas' view as involving rhetoric, agitation, and religion. Uh, what I like to do is, uh, I have nothing, uh, no problem with rhetoric and, and uh, religion, but uh, let's talk about science for a minute. Um, the most important question in economics and geopolitics today is, are capital markets and is our society a complex system? 
Um, if it's not, then uh, maybe our opponents win. But if, but if it is, uh, we have serious problems ahead of us. What do I mean by a complex system? A lot of people think, you know, your watch might be complex. It's the technical name. It's complicated. It's not complex. A complex system has the following characteristics. It has diversity, lots of points of view. It has interconnectedness, so that those different points of view are in touch with each other. Um, it has communication, so you're, you're communicating, you're transacting, you're interacting with each other. And finally, it has adaptability, which is other people's behavior affects your behavior. So those are the four defining characteristics of a complex system. There's no question. Capital markets, finance is not only a complex system, it is the complex system non-parel. Uh, this again, this is uh, physics, but it applies very, uh, very carefully, very closely to these economic systems. So let's just take, let's just do a thought experiment. We'll use the, use the audience, we'll lose all, use all of you. Uh, there are about 500 people in the room. Let's say that right now a third of you got up, screamed, and ran out the door as fast as you could. What would the rest of you do? I dare say you'd be right behind them. You wouldn't know what was up. You would say, well, they know something I don't. The place is on fire. There's a bomb scare. I'm not going to stay around to find out. I'm right behind them. Let's say a third of you were particularly nervous. You're more nervous than the rest. For you, it would only take 20 people jumping up, screaming, running out the door, and you would be right behind them. And let's say there are 20 of us who are the most nervous at all, very, very, uh, uh, very, very much on edge. And for you, it would only take five people standing up, screaming, running out the door, and you would, right, you would be right behind them. How many people do I have to persuade to empty the whole place, to cause a panic, to cause this whole place to run out the door? The answer is five people. Because if five people run, 20 more will run. If 20 run, a third run. If a third run, the whole audience runs. I like to say when it comes to the collapse of the dollar, Paul Krugman will be the last guy to leave the room, but that's his, uh, his problem. But the point is, what I just described is a technical name for it, a hypersynchronous icing model, but the point is, that's a cascade. That's how complex systems operate. It takes very small changes in initial conditions to completely, catastrophically change the outcome. What kind of complex system do we have right now? Um, we have got more debt than we had in 2008. You all remember 2008, too big to fail? Well, the biggest banks in 2008 are bigger today. They have a larger concentration of their total financial assets. Derivatives books are bigger. Uh, in a complex system, when you increase the scale, and that's what I'm talking about, the risk goes up exponentially. So let's say I increase the uh, derivatives books, I triple the derivatives books of the major banks. How much did the risk go up? Well, if you ask Jamie Dimon, he would say, eh, very little, because you know it's long, short, long, short, it all pairs off, you net it down, it's a tiny little amount. Uh, if you ask my, uh, my 84-year-old mom, she might use intuition and say, well, if you triple the system, maybe you triple the risk. The correct answer in a complex system, it's an exponential function. If you triple the scale of the system, you've increased the risk by a factor of 100 or 1,000. You've made it much more dangerous, and I just showed you how it takes a very small change in the initial conditions to cause the entire thing to collapse. So that's the system we're living in now. We're right on the knife edge. Very small perturbations, very small changes could cause a catastrophic financial collapse. And I'm not talking about the kind of long, slow, gradual decline that uh, Joe is expert on. Uh, and uh, you know, Peter, no one knows more about the sort of geography of geopolitics than Peter. Uh, but what we're talking about in the world today, we're not talking about an amphibious invasion on the beaches of uh, New Jersey or Long Island. Uh, Peter's analysis might have been certainly pertinent in 1860, probably as late as 1960. Uh, Admiral Rogers, who's the head of the United States Cyber Command, said the next war will be in cyberspace. And my only quibble with Admiral Rogers is that w that war has already begun. We're in, a, we're in a cyber war with Russia right now. Uh, in 2010, it was disclosed Russian intelligence had penetrated the NASDAQ market operating system with an attack virus. These are not hackers trying to get your credit card numbers. This is, uh, this is the military intelligence unit getting in the operating system of our second largest stock market. In August 2013, NASDAQ was closed for half a day. We've never been offered uh, explanations to what happened there. I want to suggest if the explanation was an attack, there would be good reason not to tell us because it would panic investors, start those people running out of the theater exactly as I described. So this is the situation we're, uh, we're living in today. One last point. Um, what's the R&D budget for fire? How much did it cost to invent fire? The answer is zero. The R&D budget was somebody had a bright idea someday, maybe they saw some lightning, who knows what, but they invented fire. What's the payoff to humanity from the invention of fire? Incalculable. What was the R&D budget for the Boeing 787, the Dreamliner? It's $32 billion. What was the improvement? Well, I've flown on a, on a 787. Uh, I can't tell the difference. It looks like, it's like a 767 or a 777. The point is, this is characteristics of complex systems. You get to a point where you have larger and larger inputs for no payoff. 
Fire was free, huge benefit. Boeing spent $32 billion on a new airline. Very hard to see if there's any benefit at all. How are we paying for this? We're printing the money. We're using derivatives. We're creating a dynamically unstable system. It would take very little to cause it to collapse almost overnight. Thank you. Thank you, Jim Rickards. And that concludes round one of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate, where our motion is, declinists be damned, bet on America. And remember how you voted before the debate, before the arguments began. We're going to have you vote again after closing statements. And once again, the team whose numbers have changed the most from the first to the second vote will be declared our winner. Now on to round two. Round two is where the debaters address one another in turn and take questions from me and you in the live audience. Our motion is this, declinists be damned, bet on America. We have two teams arguing for and against. The team arguing for, Joe Jaffe and Peter Zion, have, have said we've heard this whole declinist thing before. Uh, it always turns out to be exaggerated that, in fact, the long-term trends are very much in America's favor. Uh, strongest uh, GDP, its military is supreme without any near rival. Uh, other countries that might be rivals uh, just don't have the advantages that the U.S., th which include access to uh, new talent through immigration, um, the fact of our education standards, our demographics, which mean that our population will soon be younger than almost any population in the rest of the developed world. We're on our way to energy independence. The dollar is supreme. That things just couldn't really be better, a very optimistic scenario. The team arguing against the motion, uh, Krista Freeland and Jim Rickards, much more pessimistic while saying that they argue that with sadness, but that to point out the flaws in the system are, is in itself an act of patriotism. But they say that the system is very fragile, that uh, we're at a state where um, government is essentially ineffective at a time when capitalism is not working the way it's supposed to be and the middle class is losing out with no way to get out of the, uh, the rut that it's in. Uh, that the immigration uh, argument is a good one, but that we haven't sorted out how we're going to do it, and that economically the conditions are in place for a dangerous and quick and overnight collapse given the level of debt, uh, which is greater and in more mysterious places than ever before, not to mention that we are very vulnerable in issues of cyber attack. It sounds to me that there are areas in which the two of you agree on some of the basics, for example, the relative strengths and weaknesses internationally between the United States and some of its rivals. But where you appear to disagree, I would say, is on this notion of whether uh, the team arguing the team arguing against the motion, arguing not to bet on America, is really portraying a situation in which there's a rot at the core of things, that there's this fragility uh, that uh, over time is going to undermine uh, much of the American dream. And I want to take that side that argument to the side arguing for the motion. To get specific, um, Peter Zion, your opponent, Christopher Freeland, argued that the American middle class is really just in a corner uh, that it can't get out of, both because of the, the way things are running economically and because of political gridlock. That, and that, that, they're, that in itself is the reason that, you, that they can argue right now not to bet on America because of the critical role that the American middle class has played in building America. What's your response to that? Well, actually, the data doesn't support that, but uh, it's my debate partner that is in command of the date on that topic, so I think I'll, I'll punt that one to the right here. Okay, Joe Joffin, do you want to take that? We've heard this number about the middle, declining middle class for a long time. I don't think it has anything to do with the issue of whether the country as such is declining, but let's just go with the issue of equality. The way to measure inequality is not by anecdote, but by something called the Gini coefficient, which measures inequality around the world. And lo and behold, you'll be surprised. Once you take into account taxes and transfers, the United States has a Gini coefficient of 0.37. Uh, total inequality will be one, in zero will be no inequality. The great state of Canada has, it, has a Gini coefficient of 0.34. The great state of Germany, the model of the welfare state, 0.35. Italy, almost 0.4. So if you want to talk inequality, talk the right numbers. Do not talk anecdotes and repeat what you read every other day in the New York Times. John, Christopher. John, uh, uh, okay. Let me bring it to well, just, just address the... Uh, you want to see it? Okay. 
Uh, so just the, the Gini uh, coefficient uh, point, Joe said that that was after you take into account taxes and transfers. It's a little like saying it's a nice day except for the three feet of snow. Uh, the problem is if you, if you include taxes and transfers, this is uh, moving very strongly in the direction of a government-run society. So yes, with taxes and transfers, without them, without them, our Gini coefficient is worse than Mexico. When I grew up, Mexico was the classic oligarchical society. But not taking into account taxes and transfers, we're actually worse than Mexico. That's Jim, how bad things are. You can exactly argue right. both sides. Either you talk inequality or inequality. If inequality comes down by government action, isn't that what the welfare state is all about? No, let me. Christopher Freeland. So it is a truth universally acknowledged, including, I am sure, by you, Joe, that what we have seen over the past 30 years is an increase in inequality in the United States an increase, a huge increase in the share of income taken by the top 1% and 0.1%, and a stagnation of incomes and wealth of people in the middle. Now, I warned you guys he would use the cleanest dirty shirt argument and say, well, yeah, but it's bad all over. In this case, America isn't the cleanest dirty shirt on the stagnant middle class. It is a problem for everybody. I completely agree with that. Well, we but it is, hang on, hang on, Joe, hang on, Joe. It is a particular problem for the United States for two reasons. The first is we collectively, I mean, I'm very passionate about this because figuring out how to make the technology revolution 21st century economy work for the middle class, I think, is the biggest challenge of our generation. And for the Western world to figure it out, we're going to need a strong American lead, and we're going to need America to accept that this is okay. a problem. Let's let Joe Jaffe respond. Let me respond? Yes. I, I think that the issue of equality is, is, a moral, is an interesting moral issue, but it has nothing to do with what we are debating about today. We are talking about whether the United States is declining or not relative to other nations. We are not talking about where the United States was 50 or 100 years ago. It was a hell of a lot more unequal in those days. We are talking about by the measures that we normally use to measure power, economy, military, education, research and development spending, uh, 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 scientific achievement. Those are the measures, as opposed to anecdotes, that measure up or down. Well, I think, that, I, think the, I think the language of the motion does not say relative to other nations. You can make the argument that the motion includes relative to other nations, and that's fair, and they can convince the audience that it means something else. It's, uh, it's up to you Decline to be a persuasive on that. No, no one in the British Empire, the Roman Empire, the French Empire ever said, sense. we're going to have a good deal for everybody. What they said was there's rich and poor, elites and everybody else. That was the deal. So yes, we have these other things going for us. But fairness, income distribution, that is the heart of the American dream. When you take that away, there's nothing left of America. We are different. I'll, I'll Peter Zion. I'll go now, yeah. I'm sorry, but how much better than the top slot in absolute and relative term do you have to be to win this debate? I mean, the euro is dissolving as a global currency. $3 trillion has flooded the United States in the last five years. Skilled migration is at all-time highs. By every measure that matters, the United States has not fallen behind. It's pulling ahead. Uh, yeah. And that assumes that we keep maintaining a trade system that hasn't benefited us for 30 years. Uh, uh, God forbid Peter, Peter, we have a bad hair day. Peter, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you where America's number Jim one. We're, we're number one in terms of incarceration. The percentage of people yes. behind bars in the United States is double. The, this is just developed countries. We're not talking about Angola here. Just the OECD members, the developed countries. America's number one. Number two are our friends Chile, who have less than half that rate. Turkey's number 10, remember at Midnight Express? They only have one quarter of the incarceration rate. So that's, we are number one in incarceration, which is a major dysfunction in society. Turkey Joe has Joppy. more journalists in jail than any other country in the world that I know of. Let me just say something about decline. I think decline is a relative issue. It's not an absolute issue. I am taller or, or fatter or thinner than you are. Just to say that I'm tall or fat or thin is not a very interesting issue unless I compare myself to others. Well, let's take a moment, let's take a moment for Christopher Freeland to respond to that. Is it a relative issue? You said in your opening statement you're comparing it to what we used to be at some point in time. Why? But why, why is their measurement not valid relative to other nations? A couple of reasons. First of all, I think America rightly measures itself not against Turkey, is America no, no, supposed to be proud it imprisons fewer journalists than we Turkey? Have none I'm sorry, no, no, hey, Joe, I didn't interrupt you. Um, so that's really not good enough. 
America really is the city on the hill, and America needs to measure itself against itself. I'm arguing decline on two main points. One, America is failing Americans. And this is not about some, you know, namby-pamby, NPR-ish, you know, ethical, moral point. This is about saying the middle class is falling behind. And you talked, Peter, you know, movingly about Generation Y. If we talk to the Generation Y people here, there are no good jobs for Generation Y. Generation Y is being Uberized and task rabbit eyes. Let's let and Peter, that is oh, the problem. Let's let Peter Zion read. But and before look, you, Generation Y knows it. Before you do that, Peter, I just want to point out that in celebration of our 100th anniversary, NPR has some executives in the audience joining us tonight. <laughs> And they're thinking things over. Peter Zion. <laughs> Let's talk about America's past. You want to make this a relative to the United States past rather than the rest of the world? That's fine. Andrew Jackson's wife was accused in a live debate of being a prostitute while she was first lady. Gridlock is normal. John Adams was accused of being a hermaphrodite without any of the positive characteristics, whatever the hell that means. <laughs> Gen Y doesn't have opportunities. Let's take it from the economic side. Look back to the 1800s. We had an empty continent that anyone for the price of a Kia car could load up the family, head west, take land that we stole from the natives, and be exporting grain for hard currency to war-torn Europe within six months. That will never happen again, because there's not another continent. I'm glad, Jim Records. I'm, I'm, Put Jim I'm, Records, please. I'm glad, I'm glad Peter brought up Andrew Jackson. He's one of my favorite presidents for two reasons. Number one, he abolished the Central Bank of the United States. We went for about 80 years with no Central Bank, thanks to Andrew Jackson. But the other thing he did, he paid off the national debt. I don't mean he ran a budget surplus. I mean, there was no national debt, zero, at the end of Jackson, the Jackson administration. Today, our debt is over 100 percent of GDP. Now, the last time it was that high, and this is sort of to Joe's point, um, you know, it was the end of uh, World War II, and Paul Krugman says, hey, we had 100% before, no big deal, we got out of it. Yeah, but we won World War II. We had 60% of global GDP. Today, we're declining on a relative basis. Uh, we have debt. We didn't get anything for the money. The Fed printed the money. Actually, the amount of money the Fed has printed is roughly equal to the amount of additional debt in the last five years. Uh, they, they have monetized the debt. There is no way out. Uh, the, the, um, the, when this collapses, they'll be, they won't okay, be able me, to do it again. Let me they take that to Joe Joffe. Joe Joffe, it's a sort of a ticking time bomb scenario the on the economy. R word, he used relative decline. <laughs> <laughs> and relative well, decline, well, well, by the way, let me tell you, of course the United States had 50% of GDP in 45. The rest of the world was destroyed. The point is, its share has held steady for the last 50 years. But let me get, get away from this. Let me talk about gridlock, about the, in, you know, the inability to govern. Do you know what gridlock looked like in the days of Jefferson, when they used to shoot each other? <laughs> OK, that was just a debating point. Let me say something about how, in spite of this so-called so gridlock and, and, and ungovernability, how this country got out of the Great Recession. It flooded the country with liquidity. It went into heavy deficit, and it recapitalized the banks. This gridlock country, the totally polarized country, as a result of which this country is now growing at three to four, uh, three to four percent. What about the Europeans? I'm sorry to compare the United States to other countries, but where are they in terms of growth now? They've tried something. It doesn't work. Do you know the banking system in China? You just hold a little match to it, and it will explode like so, a nuclear weapon. So, yeah. so Krista, your argument could be the United States in, is in decline along with everybody else, no. is what it sounds like. No. Well, I, 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 think, I think that there is a big problem in how the Western industrialized economies are operating. Huh. And I think it's partly to do with rent seeking and you know, the inside dealing and changing the rules of the game to suit elites. I think it's mostly to do with the technology revolution and globalization. And the economy today is not delivering the kind of 
good middle class jobs which were behind the rise certainly of America but also of Western Europe and Canada in the post-war years. That's gone. We're living through a second industrial revolution comparable in its scope to the industrial revolution. And you might say to me, oh, okay, well, that's fine because the industrial revolution, it sort of worked out. And it did, but it took two world wars, a Great Depression, the Long Depression in the 19th century, oh, and also a communist revolution in Russia and China before 50 we percent hang on, 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 hang on. I didn't interrupt you guys. Don't be sexist and speak over women's no. voices. It happens. I'm sorry. It does happen. Okay, so it, it's so communist. We were on communist really, revolution. You know, I can't help you out on that one. Uh, yeah. You know. <laughs> Studies show it, read Sheryl Sandberg. Anyway, so communist revolutions in Russia and China, and then the Western world figured out this was a crisis, industrial revolution was great, but you needed a new social and political accommodation so that it worked for the mass of society. Okay. And it was called, now, hang on, hang on. No, no, just, now as moderator like, and as a sexist, I'm gonna we step We need to do the same thing now. That's Peter, why gridlock Peter, matters. you're on, Peter, you're on. She's being no, sexist. I mean, actually, in terms of the, the re industrial revolutions, I'm in complete agreement. But wow, if it's going to hurt here, it's going to wreck everybody else. Uh, I want to bring up, go back to a point that No, Jim no, no. Up. I actually want you to respond to her point. I just did. About how bad things, well, not very eloquently. I mean, she, well, she, <laughs> laid, she laid out a pretty, a pretty dire picture of things. And, no, and I, I think we'd like to know where that stands. Social development, social revolutions as part of technological change are as old as technology. So you're just saying that we'll get over it. We'll get through this no, difficult it's time. it's going to hurt. Gen Y in particular has to find new way of doing things because let's be honest here. Government is not going to lead the way in a private enterprise driven system to whatever comes next. We didn't do it the last time around. We didn't do it the time before that. We're not going to do it this time around. And from my point of view, that's neither good nor bad. It just is. But Jim brought up a comment that I really want to get back okay. to on the dissolving of the US dollar. Mm -hmm. Into what? Ever since the Eurozone decided to confiscate insured bank deposits to bail out Cyprus, everyone's moved out. Uh, what's left then? The yen of the yuan, less than 2% that's Swiss, actually traded? Swiss franc. You got the Swiss franc and the Canadian dollar are the next two. Those cannot be a global currency. So the United States, <laughs> Not suggesting for a heartbeat that I think printing currency is a good idea, but we're the only country in the world that can actually do it. Because you know why? Three quarters of it isn't even held here because it supports the global trade system. All right, let me uh, uh, give it to Jim Rickards. Yeah, I'll respond to that. Two points. Uh, there's an old saying, you're entitled to your opinion, you're not entitled to your own facts. Uh, Joe. That comes I, up so often at our I debates, wish, uh, actually. You know, <laughs> Joe, I, I really wish we were growing at 3 to 4 percent, as you said. The fact is, in 2014, the U.S. economy grew at 2.4 percent growth. Since the end of the recession, is 2.2 percent. The debt is growing faster than that. We are going bankrupt. We are on the road to Greece. So those are the facts. Now, on Peter's point... Who's going bankrupt? What, Just tell me again the who's United going States. bankrupt. The United States. Okay, let's get to that. So this goes to Peter's point. Nobody's going to replace the dollar. Like You're right. It's not, going to, it's not going to be the yuan, Peter. It's not going to be the yen. It's not going to be any of those currencies you mentioned. But I'll tell you what, we'll replace the dollar sooner than you think. The Fed printed $4 trillion to get us through the last recession. What happened was they substituted public debt for private debt. So you're right, the banks were propped up. But now all that debt's on the balance sheet of the Fed. When the next liquidity crisis come, what are they, comes, what are they going to do? Print another $4 trillion, $8 trillion, $12 trillion? What is the confidence limit? There is only one clean balance sheet left in the world. When the crisis comes, the world is going to be reliquified by the IMF using the special drawing right, which has been around since 1969. SDR is world money. Um, by the way, China will have a big vote. The U.S. will lose its veto. That's how they're going to reliquify the world. So, by the way, we won't have them in our pockets. The dollars will be walking around money like Mexican pesos or Turkish lira. But the big stuff, the price okay. of oil, balance of payments, that'll be an SDR. Jim, so I want to break in. I want to move on to it. something specific that I heard the two sides clash on in their opening statements, and that was the, the part that education is playing in this debate. Um, the team arguing to bet on America talked about the much vaunted American education system, and uh, the opponents uh, argue that there are real problems with education. So let's start with the opponents. Your, your argument about access to education in the middle class. Okay, so first of all, there was an, a point made, which I totally agree with, about the excellence of American elite universities. Your universities are great. I went to Harvard. I loved it. The problem with American education is it is 
a symptom of this wider problem of the hollowed out middle class. American education isn't delivering to the people at the bottom in the middle. And that's, you know, everyone in this room is going to agree with that. No. It, it's whether you're no. on the right or the left, no. you know that's the case. And in a, in a winner take all economy, which is today's high tech economy, that means that social opportunity is being blocked too. Did you pay your way at Harvard? Uh, no, I got scholarships. Aha. Uh -huh. From the province <laughs> me, of Alberta. Let me give you a number. Um, 60. Thank you, Sandy McTaggart. 60% of the so called elite universities, 60% of the students, are getting scholarships in one way or another. This is probably the, the best ladder of advancement you can get is the so called American elite universities. When I look at these kids in my seminar at Stanford, and I blame them for not knowing American history, and then they all look up and I see Korea, China, India, and so on. So uh, that is one thing, one other point. The next, once people concede the best universities in the world, they say, yes, but what about secondary education? Again, one has to look at the numbers. Most Americans don't know it, but there's an OECD, regular OECD study called PISA. Program of International Student Assessment. And lo and behold, that maligned American high school, when it comes to reading and math skills, these kids are pretty much in the middle with Italians, French, Isra Israelis are far down, and Germans. So that American state school system, which has been maligned for the last 100 years, is delivering pretty good stuff. At least it is not as everybody thinks, at the, at the rock bottom. Okay, I'm going to go to the audience now for some questions. And how this works is if you raise your hand, a microphone will be brought to you. We want you to not ask the question until you get the microphone to you and have it about the same distance from your mouth as this is from mine so that the radio broadcast can hear you and the podcast. And uh, we'd like you to tell us your name and then be very, very terse in asking a question that keeps us on point. And I'm going to go right in the center here. And if you can stand up, uh, the mic will be brought down to you. Thanks. Once again, just tell us your name. Shala Sadovnik. Um, I'm, it's a question for the opposition. Why does it matter that there is inequality if even the lowest are better off? So if everyone has moved up, why does the inequality matter? OK, great question. Who would like to take that? Yeah, I'll take it. Christopher um, Two reasons. First of all, strongest, pr biggest problem is the middle is stagnant, at both on income and on wealth. And employment is a real, you know, th those good jobs for the middle class are vanishing. That figure that I cited about comparing 20 to 50 year old men in the US and France, the fact that employment is lower in the US, that's a real issue. So that's the biggest reason. And inequality doesn't matter if the lowest are moving up, but they're not moving up. That's the problem. They're getting lower. That's the problem. Um, do you want to respond to that? I'd be that happy was to. that was sort of a question from your side, but go ahead. Yes. Uh, well, Peter Zang. Those of you in Gen Y who have college bills, they suck. I totally relate. Those of you who are in Gen Z, did you know that the cost of education, if you don't go to Harvard, is probably going to drop by 90% by the time that you're in college? Because you'll be able to attend schools online. Now, that's a problem if you're a college professor at the University of Wisconsin. But if you're somebody who's an education consumer, you are on the verge of the fastest advancement in educational quality ever in the history of this country. And you know what? No one planned it. Now, would you like to respond to that? Or so shall we go to another question? I'd like to move on unless you strong, feel strongly. Okay. Well, I would just say, you know, those, I, I think that uh, technology That's transforming education is a terrific thing, apart from the professors who are going to be laid off. But the, the real issue is what are going to be the jobs for those kids when they graduate? Well, I don't that's, know, but I don't that, know that, that's but the you problem. You asked that question in 1940. Who knew what they were going to be in 1960? Sir. That's the whole point of change. Sir. But but it, was a, it was a different phase in the technology Can, revolution. We, ha you, we have to accept that there, it's not this continuum. You know, the Industrial Revolution changed how the economy works. The technology revolution is doing the same thing. And yeah. we're going to have to change how politics and society okay, works. Okay, we're getting repetitive on the point, so I want to move on to another question, sir. Sorry. No, it's okay. Hi, I'm Zachary Caravel. This is a question for Mr. Rickards. So let's say I agreed with you that there is a high probability of a global synchronous economic collapse, which I don't. 
But if I did, in what way is that an indictment of or proof of the statement that America is in decline rather than a separate debate about the tenuousness of the global financial system? Well, it's like a, a school bus full of children uh, heading for a cliff and, uh, and uh, America's the driver. In other words, uh, you know, America's so much better off than the rest of the bus. The school bus driver is so much more mature than the kids in the back. But if you're going over the cliff, you're all going, going together. I don't dispute that, if, that when the dollar collapses, the other currencies will be right behind it. But this is about American leadership, which was Krista's earlier point, which is that the rest of the world, you know, the USA is missing in action in, in Minsk today. We're missing in action in uh, Brussels, where the, uh, where the Greek um, EU negotiation was going on. There's no leadership from the United States. We are the largest economy in the world. We are the leader. We control the global financial system through the Federal Reserve. I, We're the ones driving the bus over the cliff. Joe Jaffe. Let, let me again try to bring this back to, to the issue of the debate. Um, you can't prove the point about decline versus non-decline by anecdotes. Now let's take the so-called withdrawal of the United States from the global arena, which, by the way, is 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 not exactly a, a liberal kind of critique, but uh, more from the right. But and it's true that under Obama, this country has withdrawn, whether it's Minsk or Brussels or Pinsk or whatever. Do you guys know where Pinsk is? No, <laughs> I do. Uh, okay. So, but wait, 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 wait. Um, <laughs> Now, the problem is here with these arguments is that we can or you can do, uh, vote Obama out of power in two years, and this may change. The kind of long-term forces we keep talking about that Europe suffers under, China suffers under, Japan, you name it, cannot be decided or changed by vote. And that's why I plead with you to keep anecdotes and trends apart. Joe Jaffe, I don't understand why you say an argument can't be made by anecdote flatly. No. I mean, Hitler rose to power and messed up Germany. That's an anecdote, and it's no, true. No, it's not. It's not, it's not because, no, I'm sorry. To, for, to explain Hitler's rise, you have to go into heavy duty sociology and economics and history. Anecdotes prove nothing. They just make good debating Joe, points. Joe, I'm I talking took, about took, Joe, trends I, and forces. Christopher Freeland. Joe, I, I, oh, took, sorry, I, took, I took pains. I took pains to avoid anecdote. I used sure. science. It's sure. a hypersynchronous icing model. It's complexity theory. I was putting it in scientific space. We probably don't have time for the equations, but I was not using anecdotal evidence. I was telling you how collapses happen. I want to remind you we're in the question and answer section of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan, your moderator. We have four debaters, two teams of two, debating this motion, Declinists be damned, bet on America. I love this audience. These questions have been great. Sir, in the back there. Keep the streak going. Thanks. Uh, my name is Nick. The four side described many of uh, America's advantages, so a question for both sides. How are those advantages dependent or not dependent on our economic might? that the other side argued quite heavily against? Well, if I may say, if I'm, if, I, if I'm allowed to repeat myself, some of the points I made have nothing to do with economic might. The power of immigration I'm talking about has nothing to do with it. The fact, that, what does it mean for somebody like Sergey Brin to start Google? It means, it means the freedom to dream, invent, and invest. It means rule of law. It means property rights. It means no barriers to competition. That's why this Russian-born kid did Google here and not in St. Petersburg. Sounds like an anecdote to me, though. No. <laughs> no. No. The anecdote made a very important point, but I talk about <laughs> when I talk about the rule of law, that's not an anecdote. Okay, let's let the other side respond. Chris that, that was an excellent question. Um, and it gives me a chance to make a point that I really wanted to make around the immigration and demographics arguments. I agree, those are tremendous strengths. And I think the 21st century is going to be won by countries that are open to immigration and are feminist and therefore are able to have demographic growth. What I'm worried about with the US on, and, and they're related, is when it comes to immigration, you guys are divided and you're fighting about it. You know, would Sergey Brin get into the United States today? 
There is a huge immigration crisis in the U.S. with millions of undocumented immigrants, and your can't, country can't decide whether to keep them and give them status or to kick them out. That, to me, is not a country which is united around what I, I believe Joe correctly points out to be the virtues of immigration. But I think you're incredibly divided and torn on precisely this issue. So I, I see the American debate and, you know, frankly, you know, the, the American paralysis, gridlock, if you will, around immigration as a measure of decline. Okay, let's let Peter Zion respond. Thank you. On the immigration debate, we are divided, but if you look around the wider world, you're right, there isn't that division because most of them say no. And the ones that don't say hell no. The United States has the third largest foreign born in the world. Canada, of course, is number one. The United Kingdom is number two. You know, there's some commonalities here, but I wanna talk about something a little bit more structural that I think might help to that argument. Moving stuff from A to B is really hard, but if you move it on water, it's one twelfth the cost. The United States has more miles of interconnected navigable waterways than the rest of the planet put together. Peter, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut you off there because that's not really to the question. I wanna go back to questions. Um, sir, right up behind, uh, behind you actually, I'm sorry. Thanks. Hi, my name is Hans. Why is moral power not on the table for this debate, specifically as it relates to foreign policy? Can you, can you, um, as not, far as the measures of power that the team arguing well, in favor of Well, you're asking why isn't it on the table, and that's not a question that's gonna get them to, dis, to that's a different, think about a way to, I'm gonna go on to another question. If we have time, I'll come back, and I do mean it. Uh, a way to get them to actually be debating well, the issue of moral power. Down the front here, sir. Uh, John Tierney, I've got a question for the opposition for Ms. Freeland. Um, the economy tends to grow faster in times when you have divided government in Washington. So my question is, what's the problem with gridlock? <laughs> <laughs> the reason that I cited the Brookings survey is to show, you know, it, it's easy to argue it's actually not different this time. And the reason I cited that Brookings study is I think it's, qualitatively different if you can argue that compared to 65 years ago, it's twice as hard to get legislation passed. This is not a sort of healthy, divided government where the parties are coming together and making deals. This is a government where you're actually voting to stop funding the government. I is that how an adult country runs itself? Would the other side like to respond? Yeah. Sir, do you want to try again? Did you, um, did you want to give another shot at the moral question? If, I, if not, I'll, I'll pass answer, on. I'll answer, John. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I, I, no, think I, mean, I, wanted to, I actually wanted to give the other side a chance unless you strongly feel so. Would you like to respond to that point? Well, we're not an adult country. We're, we're a young country. Are we making mistakes? Yeah. Do we make the most of our gifts? Of course not. But how much better than everybody else have to be? Right, let me bring yeah, it back to, I, to Jim Records. I, I, I left the moral part of it out of the argument because I was trying to do some less obvious things. A country that celebrates the degradation of Fifty Shades of Grey is way past the point of decadence. <laughs> okay. Have you seen, I'm going to pass on it. Have you seen the hit that this movie has made in Europe? <laughs> right down in front here. That's, that's relative decline, Joe. Dana, how are we on time? Okay, right down in front here. Uh, hi, this is for the uh, pro team. Um, it seems to for, me, I, for the motion, bet on America. For the America. motion, it mm -hmm. seems to me, and I, and I could be wrong, that many of the world indexes today still rank the U.S. as um, 23rd or below most industrialized nations in, in pretty significant markers of quality of life, including <clears throat> infant mortality, mortality rates, uh, homicide, which in the U.S. VI, for example, is about 1% higher than Syria right now. Uh, literacy, health care, health care markers, science and math test rankings. So my question to you is how do you factor that in to the argument that the U.S. in large measure uh, has not been in a state of decline, if not disgrace, for some time? Look, you want Good disgrace, job, you can have disgrace. But, um, but you, you can have the disgrace. I mean, the, some of the numbers that you mentioned are right. Uh, homicide, by the way, homicide in this country has gone down enormously since the 90s, but 
that won't convince, convince you. Infant, infant, inf infant mortality, high. We can explain it. But that's not the point. The point is, what kind of standards are you setting here? Wait, why, why this, aren't... Why, is but, this, but Joe, no, why, why isn't that I'm the sorry. point? But why isn't that the point? No, and you need, you need to explain that. No, I don't... You can't see, simply assert what no. you say are the standards here. You need to explain no. to her why no. her standards don't have you're relevance. You're taking sides. I'm sorry, you're taking sides. No, no, sides. I'm asking to preserve the integrity of the sides, debate sir. here. She no, asked a fair no. question, and I, I'm asking you to explain, and rather than dismiss her standards, no. please tell her why her standards are not relevant. I was relevant. going to talk about it, but you interrupted me. All right. <laughs> you're true. I, that's true, I did. And, and you keep interrupting us. Anyway... It's my Look, job. I can set <laughs> any kind of standard which no country, no person can live up to. Does the United States have flaws? Of course it has flaws. It had tons of flaws. But it has nothing to do, this, this is not an issue, this is a moral issue which this country must fight and wrestle with, but it has nothing to do with the issue of decline or not decline. This is moral failure but not a power failure. And we are talking about decline is about power and not about going to church. Okay, you did answer my question. <laughs> Sir, in the back there. Uh, yes, my name is Cliff, and this question is for both sides. Um, the United States was founded as a uh, free market capitalist society. We were founded as a constitutional republic. How do you see how uh, today, from over the last 300 years, have we moved closer to, that, to those ideals or have we moved further away? And how does that answer the question as to whether we're in decline or not? I'll let this side there's, go first. Uh, I, was, I would say there's Two nothing markets. left, but there are no markets left. What, what you have is uh, theater. Uh, you have the appearance of markets. There are prices and things move around. But the Fed is manipulating the price of money. Money is the common denominator for every market. So when you suppress it and keep it at zero, by the way, what's the impact of that? When you keep interest rates at zero, so let's say some of you have savings accounts or my, you know, my mom has some money in the bank, they get zero. They get zero. The other side of that trade is if you're JP Morgan and you're Jamie Dimon, you're paying zero for your cost of funds. You can go out and buy some 10-year uh, notes and leverage it up 10 to 1, make 20% returns on equity. That is a $400 billion per year wealth transfer from everyday Americans to the power elite to the richest bankers. That's America today. So we have no markets left. Other side? Yeah. Peter Zane. Uh, the Founding Fathers developed a political system for a largely agrarian coastal community. Uh, the fact that we have evolved so much from that and still have the oldest constitution in the world, I think, is a sign of incredible flexibility and strength on our part, and God forbid me for saying this, even on the part of our political leadership. Uh, the space that we have is a big part of that on both sides. It also speaks to the question on standards. We're the least urbanized of the industrialized countries. So everything that we do for a city that we then have to do for a constellation of a thousand small towns that still have autonomy, that is a degree of political self-determination that doesn't exist in any other political system on the planet, and I think that's admirable. Um, can we... Judge Jaffe. Can we compare the United States with the United States? I mean, when we talk about moral turpitude or failure, what, what, how would we rate what followed the crime of slavery in the 60s, when I was in college when we took over City Hall for civil rights issues and something like that? Uh, hasn't this country done a hell of a good job in, with the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, bringing previously downtrodden and discriminated people up to be, turn them into real citizens? Is that not a kind of moral achievement, or, or what is this? If we think in terms of inequality, which used to obtain in this country when there was a you know, Anglo wasp overclass ruling over others, and now one group after another being emancipated and made full citizens, is that moral failure, or what is that? All right, Christopher Freeland, the argument that, that there's moral, moral success. More so fiber. I think we're all going to agree that ending slavery is a good thing. Um, I think no, we'll no, no, probably no, but that, all that, agree. That's, that's dismissing the point. No, no, but I'm going I'm to continue. Okay. I think we're all going to agree also that making women citizens and giving us the right to vote and participate fully is a good thing. And I would add, because I, I do think there has been a rights revolution, not just in the United States, but 
around at least the Western world. And I think um, the fact that lesbian and gay people have increasingly full rights, although uh, they did have the right to marry in Canada in 2005, is uh, a really important and great thing. But we can't ignore Ferguson and the protests and hands up, don't shoot. There is still an American underclass, and that underclass today is feeling deeply oppressed, partly by the economic circumstances that I was talking about, and, and the American moral obligation to constantly advance this rights revolution is one reason why I am so agitated about dwindling economic opportunity in the middle and the bottom. Uh, yeah. I want to let the other side respond yeah, first. Yeah, sure. Uh, don't get me wrong. Ferguson was bad. One happens in Brazil every eight hours. I mean, yes, getting shot in the street is bad. You want to live in Gaza? Sure, political representation is difficult sometimes. How about the fact that a lot of what Snowden stole is being used by the Russians to monitor and destroy communications networks across the Russian Federation right now? Do we screw up? Yeah, a lot. That's what happens when you're a superpower. Lenses are on you, comparisons are made, which are not exactly fair. But the trick is to use what we have, which is the strongest economic system and the strongest political system in the world to figure out how we want to make it better. Will we get it with this Congress? I don't know. Will we get it with this president? I don't know. Jim Rickards. But the, the proposition is, is America in decline? And Joe's recitation of some of the great achievements of American history, and there's no disputing them, shows you know, where are the accomplishments that the 60s were great. The, you know, many, many th great things happened in, uh, in American history. Where are they today? That's precisely the point. Those best days, those highest aspirations, America is a city on a hill. That's what's behind us. That's why we're in decline. We don't have anything to compare to that. And that concludes round two of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate, where our motion is declinists be damned, bet on America. And please remember how you voted before the debate, after closing statements, which will be brief. We'll have you vote a second time, and then we will present you with the results. On to round three, closing statements by each debater in turn. They will be two minutes each. Our motion is this, declinists be damned, bet on America. And here to summarize his position in support of the motion, Joe Jaffe, senior fellow at Stanford, and, uh, uh, sorry, senior fellow at Stanford, um, and uh, editor, publisher of Divides. Okay. Um, a lot of our debate uh, reminds me of the story about Socrates being asked in the Agora, Socrates, how is your wife? And he says, compared to what? <laughs> and let me repeat this again. When we talk about decline, we are talking about comparison. And we are talking also, if you wish, about progress how we compare America then with America now. And, um, but, the, but the most important thing is, is there somebody as we have argued in this country from decline 1.0 to decline 5, is there somebody who is better, more agile, more virile, more ambitious, more skillful, and, and will that nation overtake the United States? And as I tried to, 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 to make the point I was trying to make is that these challenges we thought were growing faster, were doing better, have all fallen by the, by the wayside, which therefore then let, made me look at the inherent and not the anecdotal uh, sources of strength of this country. And if you look at the economy, the way this economy has rebounded, while no other economy after the crash has rebounded, you must kind of say there must be something here, and we can explain it, why the country does better in those respects. And if you look at the relative decline of Japan, Europe, the United States in terms of global GDP, that gives you a sense that, again, transcends individual stories and tells you something about trends. And that's why I think the uh, decline is a good pedagogical device. And if you notice, half the time we spoke about how America should get better, which is a very good thing to talk about. But the issue is whether this country is declining vis-a-vis -vis others. And there, you have no data whatsoever that makes the point. In fact, the opposite is true. Thank you, Joe Jaffe.
The motion is Declinus be damned, bet on America, and here to summarize his position against the motion, Jim Rickards, Chief Global Strategist at the West Shore Funds. I'm not sure how many people in the audience uh, walked to the theater tonight. It's, uh, it's a New York venue, so I dare say uh, some of you walked. Uh, New York's a great walking city. Um, and I dare say that your walk to the theater tonight was completely uh, uh, und undisturbed, unperturbed, uh, and that's a great thing about New York. But if this event were being held in Brooklyn, where my, uh, my daughter happens to live, uh, and if some of you lived in Bed-Stuy, I dare say you might not have made it uh, quite so comfortably as the people here on the Upper West Side. Uh, you might have had your, fat, your face smashed into a granite wall. You might have had handcuffs put on you. You might have been thrown in a van, taken away, taken to a precinct, and strip searched for nothing, no probable cause, completely unconstitutional. Now, we call this stop and frisk. That's a nice euphemism. It sounds good, doesn't it? You know, you stop, you frisk the person. If there's a gun or there's drugs, you know, they got a problem. If there's no, no gun, you know, just let them go on their way. You know, it may be unconstitutional, but we're sort of okay with that because, uh, after all, we don't like guns. But that's not what happens. That's not what most of the people uh, experience. They actually have this, uh, I think, a smash and strip would be a better description of stop and frisk. So that's what's going on in the city of New York. Now, also in the city of New York, a few miles away, you have the most corrupt enterprise in history called J.P. Morgan and its fellow banks, Citibank, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley. These companies have paid over $30 billion in fines, penalties, restitution, and compliance costs in the last four years. And new cases are coming out every day. There was a new case in the New York Times yesterday about foreign exchange manipulation, another one I saw today. Not one single executive of any of these banks has gone to jail. Not one has even been indicted. There hasn't been a trial. And as long as America is a country where innocent bystanders are getting smashed and stripped and bankers are being left alone, America is a country in decline. Thank you, Jim Rickards. That is the motion, Declinus be damned, bet on America. And here to summarize his position supporting the motion, Peter Zion, geopolitical strategist and author of The Accidental Superpower. Never underestimate the ability of the Americans to panic, learn the wrong lessons, and wreck everything. Sputnik, beeping aluminum grapefruit. We were ahead in metallurgy, electronics, even rocketry. Sputnik fell out of the sky three weeks later. Vanguard 1, our first satellite, still up there. As a result of our panic attack, we refabricated everything about our educational and scientific system. We coasted on that for three, I'm sorry, for two generations. Vietnam, we lost a post-colonial war to a rice producer. It wasn't our colony, we didn't lose a single ally, and we were the world's largest rice exporter at the time. As part of our overreaction to Vietnam, we have crossed what was then information technology with weapons so we would never have to fight at arm's length again. We got everything from cruise missiles to cell phones out of that. Japanophobia. We became convinced in the 1980s that we had lost our position as a superpower, not would, had, to a country with less usable land than Massachusetts, who we were occupying at the time. <laughs> Wall Street forced a corporate reckoning that generated the biggest burst of capital that we've ever seen. We are reliably our own worst enemy, but we are also reliably our own best motivators. You wanna talk about the next crisis that we're likely to cause? Look at the aftermath of 9-11. We now have pre-positioned military forces on either side of every significant trade and energy artery on the planet. We are one waking up on the wrong side of bed away from perhaps pre precipitating the worst economic and military catastrophe this world has ever known. And it's one that we would be largely immune to. So, decline us be damned. Bet America against America if you will, but do so at your own risk. The record just doesn't hold. I urge you to support the motion. Thank you, Peter Zion. That is the motion, Declinus be damned, bet on America. And here to summarize her position supporting this motion, Krista Freeland, Member of Parliament in Canada. My mother was born in a displaced persons camp, um, which you would probably call a refugee camp in Germany. Her family was fleeing the Soviet invasion of Ukraine during the Second World War. And so it was a particular personal pleasure for me to start my career as a reporter in 1991 in the Soviet Union as it fell apart. 
I was in Ukraine when it voted for independence. I was in Belarus when Yeltsin, Kravchuk, and Shushkevich signed the document that dissolved the USSR. And I thought then, as I think many people did, that that was going to be the beginning of an era when even more people around the world could enjoy capitalist democracy, this thing created by many countries, but particularly represented and led by the United States. Instead, where are we today? Today, as we speak, an irredentist Russia has actually annexed, made part of Russia part of Ukraine. And instead of opposing this, some of these great rising democracies, Brazil, India, are actually on Russia's side because they don't want the US to be a bully in the world. So the world needs an America which is strong enough to assume moral and political leadership whose middle class feels it has so many opportunities at home, it has the strength and the will to share those with the world. If we can't hang together like that, surely we will hang singly. Now, we've heard from Peter and Joe that America sometimes screws up, but then it comes to its senses, changes course, and gets it right. I'm arguing this side because I think in a lot of ways, America needs to change course. Denial is not a strategy. So please vote for us and then go out and vote in 2016 and start changing your country's course. It's really important Thank for you, all of us. Thank you, Your time is up. And that concludes our closing statements. And now it's time to learn which side you feel has argued the best. We're going to ask you again to go to the keypads at your seats and take a look at this motion. Declinists be damned. Bet on America. If you agree with this motion, push number one. If you disagree, push number two. And if you became or remain undecided, push number three. Um, while we're doing that, the first thing I wanted to say was um, I wanted to congratulate the debaters for, for the quality of the argument they brought to the stage. Um, really. And the questions were also terrific tonight. Even the question that, the, as you saw, the moral question was picked up by one of the debaters. So thank you to all, everybody who asked a question as well today. So on, on this occasion of our 100th debate, I'd like to thank our, uh, our first time and long time audience members for coming tonight. We have a number of former Intelligence Squared debaters who are with us today, so you've probably seen them here in the past as well. We have members of our board uh, and our advisory council and to all of our friends, the generous supporters who make these debates possible. I just want to say thank you after 100 of these things for bringing this whole, this whole enterprise together. Um, I also want to encourage everybody to please visit the iq2us.org site and make a donation. Um, the, I know that you paid to get in here with tickets and we very much appreciate that, but the truth is that the ticket price doesn't come close to uh, paying the cost for it. We rely on donations. We have a, a lovely um, app that you can get on your iPhone or uh, your Android phone and you can donate through there or through our website and it would mean a great deal to us so that we can grow and keep this going for another 100 debates. Our next debate will be right here, March 11th at the Kaufman Center. We will deb to be debating whether the U.S. should adopt Europe's version of the right to be forgotten. Um, debating with us, we'll have a former director of global public policy at Google and law professors from Harvard and the University of Chicago and the EU's commission, uh, EU Commission's Director of Fundamental Rights and Citizenship. And before that, on Tuesday, February 24th, we're going to be uh, holding a debate in Washington, D.C. at George Washington University. The motion will be, liberals do not tolerate intellectual diversity on campus. For the full uh, list of those debates and to purchase tickets, visit our website, iq2us.org. And as I've pointed out, uh, our app allows you to download all now, after tonight, 100 of our debates. And you can search for iq2us to find the app uh, in the iTunes Store or Google Play. And you can watch the uh, live stream. So we're going to have the results in just a second, but we're going to do something unusual tonight. We're going to bring on a special guest with a piece of art uh, for a, a, a few minutes. Um, who is going to celebrate with us our 100th anniversary in the form of a short rap history of IQ2. I want to bring on Baba Brinkman. 
Uh, I, I need, to, as a disclaimer, this is a work of art. The views expressed will be Baba Brinkman's. Uh, they will be excellently well done. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Baba Brinkman. What do you do when you've had 100 debates besides hire a Canadian rapper to try to summarize them in four minutes, right? All right. Welcome to the gladiator pit where blood is entirely metaphorically shed with razor wit. The crowd is agitated, only death can satiate it. They bay for it, also metaphorically. Actually, the crowd patiently sits, evaluating each debater's degree of persuasiveness while waiting for their moment to key all of their appraisals in. If you can think of a major disagreement of today, it's probably safe to say that this place has debated it. Everything from Obamacare to designer babies, intelligence squared, oh yeah, they're kind of crazy, from politics to religion, if it's controversial, they've covered it. They've had debaters from Christopher Hitchens to Arianna Huffington. Now, in 2006, the culture of New York was enhanced by the godfather of this event, Bob Rosencrantz. Now, he saw the competitions they were putting on in Britain, and damn, he thought New Yorkers would want to give it a chance. And bam, 100 debates later, it's still an affair. It's got a buzz like Phil Collins would fill in the air, Intelligence Squared. Debaters are debonair like Fred Astaire. Peter Singer was here peddling unpopular fare, advocating for euthanasia and rationing end-of-life care. Robert Reich persuaded a crowd such as yourselves to tax millionaires, but Karl Rove won his debate, so it's not just liberals in here, the proposition was George W., the worst president in 50 years? <laughs> Debatable. <laughs> Michael Crichton stood on this stage to deny climate change, followed by hurricanes in New Orleans. Along came the waves, and now Michael Crichton is rolling over in his grave. If you want to debate, you came to the right place. Even the titles are designed to get a rise and make us irate. Things like, millennials don't spend, stand a chance. Spy on me. I'd rather be safe. Hey, legalize drugs. Don't eat anything with a face. Some of the titles are provocative, and some are just odd. The U.S. drone program is fatally flawed. Um, men, by the way, are finished. Wait, how about this one? Science refutes God. Dinesh D'Souza disputed that and got indicted for fraud. <laughs> See, most of the debate titles are actually pretty safe, straightforward and safe, except the hydraulic fracturing one. They called it No Fracking Way. So how come the other debate titles don't get a pun? This was Declinus Be Damned, but I bet I could think of a better one, like you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away from America, know when to run. <laughs> See, I don't know if betting against America is a, a rational choice or if it's just a feeling, but if it's just a feeling, then it's one that's shared by many, such as myself and Chris de Freeland. And I would have included you as well, Peter, but your last name isn't pronounced Zeeland, so I had to move <laughs> past it. See, see uh, you know, I, I don't know whether um, it's really going to happen. Like, betting on America for me doesn't seem hard because I am a Canadian right here applying for a green card. See, or maybe the other side will carry it off. I mean, here's a Canadian stealing an American's job. But but either way, look, this place is no stranger to controversies. Ayan Hirsi Ali debated mercilessly. Three out of four people would have said that Islam is a religion of peace. But when that little infidel had finished her peace, well, then after that, 55% disagreed. Booyah, your grandmother's benefits, they were defended by Howard Dean. And uh, they were defended by Howard Dean. And wait a minute, what about banning college football? Only 16% agreed, but Malcolm Gladwell flipped that number to 53. The audience blinked, and the tipping point was achieved. This event <laughs> is put on by an elite team. No embellishment. You got Dana from Canada, Leah, Clea, Amy, and Allison. You got Adelaide, not the city, and Chris, who does the research. And it's hard to overstate how much John Donvan needs her. Speaking of John Donvan, he's a rock. Mr. Constant, 82 straight debates. Mr. Cool, calm, confident. Nobody's better at telling an audience member their question is unwanted. <laughs> Although, you guys did pretty well tonight, I have to say. But I swear, Donvan could moderate a peace treaty between brothel and convent. Intelligence Square. It's a New York City phenomenon, and tonight's debate is about to make it a hundred strong. Give the audience what it wants, persuasion and clever statements and straight facts, and make some noise for the next gladiator debaters to enter the cage match. Brah! <laughs>
All right. <laughs> all right. The results are all in. The motion is this, decline us be damned, bet on America. You have voted twice, once before the arguments and once again after the arguments, and the team that wins is the, te is the team that has changed its position the most in percentage point terms. Let's look at the first vote. The result was 49% agreed with the motion, bet on America, 23% were against, 28% were undecided. So those are the first results. Again, it's the number whose teams move the most, it's the team whose numbers move the most in percentage point terms. Let's look now at the second vote. The team arguing for the motion, the second vote, they got 64%. They went from 49 to 64%. That picked up 15 percentage points. That's the number to beat. Let's see the team arguing against. They went from 23% to 27%, only four percentage points. Not enough. The team arguing for the motion, decline us be damned. Bet on America has won this debate. Our congratulations to them. Thank you from me, John Donvan, and Intelligence Squared US. We'll see you next time.